When you think of ecosystem preservation, you probably think of places like the Amazon rainforest or the Great Barrier Reef, but there are so many more ecosystems close to home that need to be protected and preserved for future generations. This video will cover some of the most important ecosystems that are found here in Wisconsin that serve as homes to 1,800 native plants and 700 native animal species. Wetlands are one of the most important ecosystems for both the wildlife of Wisconsin as well as the people of the state. Wetlands are classified as any landform that is saturated with water, including marshes, swamps, and bogs. This characteristic makes it ideal for a wide variety of birds, reptiles, amphibians, and aquatic mammals. Furthermore, wetlands contain a lot of water-loving plants that cannot be found anywhere else. Due to the plant mass found in wetlands, they naturally filter water and act as a buffer area that can help to reduce flooding in the surrounding areas. These ecosystem services help to reduce the cost of water treatment and the damage of possible flooding. Along with the important natural services that wetlands provide, they are also very popular for tourism, bird watching, and scientific research. This picture on the right is from Horicon Marsh, one of the largest and most famous wetlands in the state. So what reason would we have for destroying the wetlands? Well, that great biodiversity and constant flooding creates very fertile soil underneath that is in prime condition for agricultural development. As a result, 50% of all Wisconsin wetlands have been filled in or drained since 1800 as we depleted our other soils and looked for new land to farm. After that land has been turned into farmland, the runoff of harsh pesticides and other chemicals can threaten the remaining wetlands nearby. These are the primary threats that our wetlands face. But how can we stop this destruction? One important step is to make sure that we manage the farmland we already have in order to keep the soil usable. This will lower the demand for new land and lower the demand for filling in wetlands. On the land that has already been claimed for agriculture, we need to be careful with what is being spread on the fields and identify possible problems that may arise before they arise. In the future, we need to protect wetlands by creating natural reserves and protected parks. These can help ensure the health of ecosystems for future generations. The health of wetlands affects many other Wisconsin ecosystems, like the lake system. There are over 15,000 lakes in the state of Wisconsin, and many of them are interconnected, meaning the health of one lake can affect the health of any body of water it is connected to. Lakes and rivers really form the backbone of many ecosystems, partially because every living species in Wisconsin either directly or indirectly depends on lakes and rivers. Some rely on it as a source of drinking waters, while others live in and around the water full-time. If the health of the lake system is not protected, all of the species that rely on them, including humans, could be at risk. Their primary threat to the lake system is something called eutrophication, which is essentially excessive algae growth. Eutrophication is caused when phosphorus runoff gets into the water. Phosphorus is one of the limiting chemicals that algae lacks, so when there's ample supply of phosphorus, algae can grow at incredibly dangerous rates. When this happens, a blanket of algae forms on the surface of the water that can take away oxygen from other species in the lake, which in many cases can kill animals that live in and around the lake. This causes a massive disruption in the local food chain and can also impact general water quality, making it uninhabitable for animals, unpleasant for humans, and undrinkable. Like mentioned earlier, the lakes are important for many Wisconsin ecosystems, so the decline in the health of lakes can lead to the decline in other ecosystems as well. Luckily, there's been a lot of research into our lake system, and we know how to address these problems. We can remove phosphorus from the lake and riverbeds with dredges. The problem is what to do with the phosphorus once it has been removed, because if it's not disposed of properly, it will end up back in the water. There have been a few different ideas proposed, including creating a dry farm fertilizer with excess phosphorus. Once we remove the phosphorus, it's important to make it harder for it to find its way back to the water. This can be done by creating more green spaces outside of lakes by replacing concrete with shrubs and grass. These areas will act as buffer zones to help catch the phosphorus and use it as fertilizer in the grass before it gets back to the lake. Tall grass prairies once covered almost a third of the entire state. Over time, their presence has dwindled. Most of the tall grass prairies have been converted into developed cities or farmland because of their flat and fertile soil. Prairies are also threatened by invasive species, poor land management, and overgrazing. So why should we save them? Well, they are important habitat for many landmark Wisconsin species like deer and turkey. They're also an important pollination site for bees and other insects that we depend on to pollinate our crops. The tall grass itself is an especially resilient plant with deep roots that help control erosion, filter groundwater, and act as a sink for pollution and carbon dioxide. 
On the right, you can see just how deep those roots are, over six feet in many cases. You can also see Curtis Prairie in Madison, Wisconsin, which is an ongoing natural restoration project. The land for Curtis Prairie was purchased in 1886 for agricultural use and due to poor land management had deteriorated by 1932. By the 1960s, the area was essentially destroyed and was in deep need of restoration. The project was a huge success that included new planting methods, soil preparation, and other active management like controlled burning. You can see the before and after of a controlled burning on the right here. The project at Curtis Prairie was one of the first of its kind and serves as a great example of how we can restore prior ecosystems. Boreal forests are found primarily in the northern half of the state and are home to a wide variety of trees, shrubs, and animals. They include many rare conifers and orchids. The variety of trees creates great habitats for many different birds, including the rare evening grosbeak pictured to the right. Due to intense logging operations of the past century and clearing for agricultural use, the boreal forests of Wisconsin are mostly gone. There's only one conifer-dominated boreal forest remaining, which is found on Devil's Island. These forests are important not only because they serve as animal habitats, but because they provide many great ecosystem services. Beyond timber, which must be harvested sustainably, these forests provide large amounts of biomass that can be used for biofuel. Much like tall grass prairies, forests act as carbon sinks as well. Due to the destruction of our forests, many species of native Wisconsin birds are migrating farther north to Canada. So what can we do to restore these forests and bring our birds back? In this case, the obvious solution is the right solution. We need to harvest timber sustainably and replant areas that have been mowed down in the past. When we do replant these forests, we need to make sure it is with a variety of different species of trees, as right now the existing forests are dominated by aspens. When we plant different trees and increase the biodiversity of an area, we make it more resilient against possible future problems like disease and invasive species. One great example of active restoration was done in the Superior Coastal Plain, which restored 120 acres of forest. This is an ongoing, actively managed project that will hopefully create a healthy ecosystem in years to come. Although we may not always think about it, there are active ecosystems within our cities. These ecosystems, which are closely tied to human metropolitan areas, are called urban ecosystems. Like all ecosystems, urban ecosystems are made of both biological and physical components, although many of the physical components within an urban ecosystem are man-made. These components include sewers, sidewalks, parks, roads, buildings, and many other structures. One characteristic of animals within an urban ecosystem is that t they tend to be resilient and highly adaptable. Think of pigeons, raccoons, and squirrels, which are commonly found in cities. The plants of urban ecosystems are really important because they help filter air that is filled with car exhaust. Having adequate foliage within a cityscape can help keep pollution lower and air quality higher. Urban ecosystems are particularly unique in that each one is almost entirely shaped by the people who live in it. Every action we make, whether we know it or not, will affect our e urban ecosystem. Places like parks must be kept clean and habitable if animals are to use them alongside humans. Furthermore, humans must be careful to not interfere with animal dwellings that they might find within parks. Organisms living within and around an urban ecosystem are more vulnerable to pollution than other pollu populations because they live at such a large source. Low air quality can have an effect on the lifespan and quality of life of not only animals but humans as well. So what can we do to help create and maintain ecosystems that many of us interact with on a daily basis? One way is to create natural parks with a variety of native plants. These parks can serve as safe spaces for many of the city's animals that regularly interact with humans. If there is a more natural space for animals to live within cities, they're less likely to build their homes where, they, where, where we don't want them to, like under our decks or in our garages. Another way to promote the urban ecosystem is to plant and maintain gardens that include native plants. These plants help to filter air and provide more possible service to the ecosystem than lawn grass.